and millions of seniors who are struggling and are making choices about whether they heat their homes adequately, whether they put food on the table that they need, or whether they're able to purchase the medicine that they desperately need. And those are choices uh, that seniors in the richest country in the history of the world should not be forced to make. So the first point that I want to make to you is in fact we are living in the wealthiest country in the history of the world today. That's the truth. Yet what has happened in the last 30 years is there has been a massive redistribution of wealth. Unfortunately, that redistribution has gone in the wrong direction. It has gone from the middle class and working families of America to the top one-tenth of one percent. Top one-tenth of one percent has doubled the percentage of wealth they own, while the middle class has seen a significant decline in the percentage of income they own. And the result of that is that we have 47 million people living in poverty. The result of that is that for the last 40 years, middle class is disappearing. And here in New Hampshire, in Vermont, all over this country, you have people working longer hours for lower wages. And almost all of the new wealth and all of the new income created is going to the top 1%. So what do we do? Well, we do a lot of things, but let me focus on a couple of issues right now. In America today, we have seen an increase in the poverty rate among seniors. So what we are seeing is a whole lot of seniors just struggling to make ends meet. And in my view, given that reality, given the reality that many people who soon will become seniors, people in their 50s, early 60s, have almost no savings at all and will be dependent upon Social Security for virtually all of their post-retirement income, we need not only to extend Social Security benefits, we need to expand them. Yeah. All right? Why do I say that? Well, I say that for two reasons. Uh, number one, now you tell me, and I'm, this is a question. Is you all right? You'll ask me questions. I'm going to ask you a question. Tell me how, in a climate like the Hampshire or Vermont, where it gets pretty cold in the winter, people have got to heat their homes, how does a senior citizen, often dealing with health problems, you're 80 years old, 85 years old, how do you survive at thirteen or $14,000 a year? Somebody want to help me out here? I'm not sure how you do it myself, but can somebody tell me how a disabled vet or a senior survives on $14,000 a year? Yes, ma'am. Um, a lot of people go to like the churches for lunches. Yes. Um, the charities are helping out. Charities and the congregate meal programs that many see. You have a congregate meal program here? Um, I came yeah. from Vermont. Yeah. And they have okay. so. yeah, those help. But I can also tell you that against my wishes and against my vote, there are cutbacks in some of these programs. Meals on Wheels program, fantastic program. Yeah. Many states around the country have long waiting lines for people to get into that program so they can get one good nutritious meal a day. Other thoughts on how somebody making it on third trying to live on thirteen thousand? Yes, sir. I believe that a lot of the older people now starting to rely on their children for support. Good. That's a very good point. And the point there is often their children are struggling as well. All right. So here's what I think. Let me tell you a word about Social Security. And this, I understand Secretary Clinton was here uh, the other day, and I think she and I have a strong disagreement on this. Uh, when my right-wing Republican friends tell you that Social Security is going broke, I want to make it very clear to you that they are not telling the truth. Social Security today has $2.8 trillion in the trust fund, which can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American 
for the next 19 years. Now, 19 years is not enough. We want it to be longer. But that's where it is. And at the end of 19 years, it would be able to pay out about 75% of all benefits. Now, if we want to extend the life of Social Security for another 50 years, say until 2065, and if we want to expand benefits for all low and moderate income seniors, what is the best way to do it? Well, the best way to do it, and I've introduced legislation to do this, and I think Secretary Clinton and I have a difference of opinion on this, is you, what we call, scrap the cap. You lift the cap. You know what that means? Yes. That means that right now, somebody is making five million a year, somebody is making 118,000 a year, they are both contributing the same amount into Social Security. I think that's wrong. Yes. I think if you saw it at $250,000 a year, you lift that cap so that someone is paying a million, making a million a year, pay 6.2%, the same as somebody's making $50,000 a year, we can extend the life of Social Security till 2065, and we can expand benefits for many, many seniors. And that's what I think has got to be done. Now, people say, well, is it fair to do that? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is, because in recent years, as I mentioned, we've seen a huge transfer of wealth to the wealthiest people in this country. And I do believe that it is the right thing uh, to ask those folks to help out in extending and expanding Social Security benefits. But this is a crisis issue. I have been, I go all over my state, state of Vermont, not much different than New Hampshire. And I talk to a lot of seniors who, in fact, are cutting their dosages of medicine in half. Does that make any sense? Seniors who are not getting the food they need uh, to stay healthy. Seniors who are not adequately heating their homes in the wintertime. And all of those things, by the way, contribute to seniors becoming sicker and ending up in the hospital at great expense. So I think, as the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, it is our job to make sure that every senior in this country can live in security and dignity. We should not have to have seniors going to charity in order to deal with their basic needs. And that's why I believe we should uh, expand Social Security benefits and we can do it in a way that is fair. Now, there's another issue I want to say a few words about. Uh, an issue that I think is of uh, increasing concern uh, to the American people and to seniors in particular, and that is the outrageously high price of prescription drugs. All right? This has always been a problem. I think it is a more serious problem today. Let me tell you a little story that some of you uh, may already know. Back in the 1990s, when I was Vermont's congressman, before I was elected uh, to the Senate, I took a busload of women uh, in northern Vermont over the Canadian border to Montreal. Anyone remember that or know why I did that? Yes. Yeah. Right, why did I do that? I did it. The beds are cheaper. These women, by and large, were dealing with breast cancer and they needed a lot of medication. They were mostly working class women, and they couldn't afford the medication that they were buying. We went to Canada, and we had arranged all of this, and we bought the medicine that many of them were using, a medicine called tamoxifen for breast cancer. They bought it in Canada, this is in the late 1990s, things may have changed, for one-tenth of the price that they were paying in the United States. Can you imagine? Ten percent. And these are working class women struggling for their lives dealing with breast cancer. And they bought medicine in Canada for 10% of the price they were paying here in the United States. Now, out of that trip came a whole lot of movement. Other members of Congress took their constituents over the border. And the end result of that is, if I'm not mistaken, it's millions of people today in America are now buying less expensive prescription drugs in Canada. But we should not have to go to Canada to buy medicine. Not online, not making a trip over the border. The United States should not have 
by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Not just Canada, it is Germany, it is countries all over the world. And the reason we have the highest prices is there is no legislation, nothing, that prevents drug companies from doubling the price of your medicine tomorrow. You can walk in to a drugstore and the druggist says, well, sorry, your price of your medicine is doubled. There's no law against that. They can do it. They can get whatever the market will bear. And recently, by the way, we have seen not only brand name drugs go way up, we have seen generics going way, way up. And I'm talking about doubling and tripling and quadrupling. For no rational economic reason other than they think they can get it. They can get it. Uh, we now have uh, cancer doctors writing uh, to Congress and saying, you know what? My patients have cancer and they cannot afford the medicine I am prescribing. Now what, what sense does this make? Somebody who's struggling with cancer can't afford the medicine that the doctors are prescribing. And here's a fact. Go out and talk to your local doctors. And what they will tell you is that a significant number of their patients cannot fill, cannot afford to fill the prescriptions that the doctors are writing. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, one in five Americans cannot afford to fill the prescriptions the doctors are writing. What sense is that? If you go to the doctor and you're sick, the doctor writes out a prescription, and you can't afford to fill it, what sense does that make? So we got a real problem on our hands, and there are a number of ways uh, that I think we should deal with it. But I should also tell you that the pharmaceutical industry is one of the most powerful lobbies in Washington, D.C. They are enormously powerful. Last year, the pharmaceutical industry employed 1,400 lobbyists and spent over $250 million on campaign contributions and lobbying expenses. What do you think about that? All right? It is disgusting. And that's why they have beaten back virtually every effort to lower the cost of prescription drugs. They make all these campaign contributions, and they have enormous numbers of lobbyists. While millions of Americans cannot afford to buy the prescription drugs they need, the top three drug companies in America combined, top three combined, made $45 billion in profits last year. And they spent more on sales and marketing than they did on research and development. So it's not like they're using all of their profits to try to invest in cures for cancer or diabetes. They spend more on sales and marketing than on research and development. Total spending on medicine in the United States has gone up by more than 90% since the year 2002. The monthly cost of cancer drugs has more than doubled over the last 10 years. Doubled so that it is now, if you have cancer, the monthly cost is about $9,900 per month. How's that? So in my view, it is time for the United States to join the rest of the industrialized world by implementing prescription drug policies that work for everybody and not just for the CEOs of the pharmaceutical industry. And we can do this in a number of ways. First of all, we need Medicare, which obviously purchases a whole lot of prescription drugs, to start negotiating drug prices with the pharmaceutical industry. You follow what I'm saying? Every other major country on earth, the reason why it is so much less expensive in Canada and in Germany is they have national health care programs which sit down with the drug companies and say, okay, let's talk about how much you're going to charge us. We purchase a huge amount of drugs and we're going to negotiate with you. Not in the United States. We don't do that. And the second thing we need to do is to allow wholesalers and pharmacists and distributors to be able to purchase less expensive prescription drugs, the same drugs at less cost around the world. Now here's a funny story. I am not a great fan 
of what we call unfettered free trade, NAFTA, CAFTA, Permanent Noble Trade Relations with China. I think a lot of these trade agreements have resulted in factories shutting down in America and our jobs going to China and other low-wage countries, okay? And I vote against those agreements. But here's something really interesting. And this speaks to the power of the pharmaceutical industry. You can have lunch today and you can get lettuce and tomatoes from a farm in Mexico which is virtually not regulated at all. Okay, comes into the United States, not a problem. But somehow it is against the law for your local pharmacist or the distributor he deals with to purchase less expensive brand name drugs from Canada or Germany. Can't do it. Against the law. Now, the only reason for that is the power of the pharmaceutical industry. They do not like the idea that distributors and pharmacists could bring medicine into this country at half the price that the companies are selling it in this country. And that has got to change. There are other things that we can do. But if we are serious about reforming health care in America and keeping our people healthy and well, we need affordable medicine. And as President of the United States, you are looking at someone who is prepared to take on the pharmaceutical industry. So, to wrap it up, and I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, number one, I do not believe, as some do, in raising the retirement age for people who will be on Social Security. People have worked their entire lives. They are entitled to decent retirement. I am categorically against what many of my Republican colleagues are talking about, people coming right through your state, about cutting Social Security benefits. Some want to privatize Social Security. That's what Bush tried to do. I believe that Social Security is enormously important for the future of this country. When people came together in Congress to try to cut Social Security, I organized a caucus in the U.S. Senate called the Defending Social Security Caucus, and we fought back really hard against the so-called chain CPI. Anybody here know what a chain CPI is? Now this is really funny, and this is just, we talk about absurdities and why Congress is rated about 3% or 10% or whatever it is. Here's this. This year, what kind of COLA increase did seniors get? What did Social Security just announce last month? Zero. Anyone know? A zero increase. There are many in Congress who think that zero increase is too generous. You're laughing? That's true. And it should be cut. What for years, Republicans fought for, and some Democrats, was a chained CPI. What a chained CPI, that's a complicated term, which simply says that the way we calculate COLAs, cost of living adjustments today, has been too generous. Got it? The zero is too generous. And we've got to calculate it a different way, which is less generous. Now, obviously, this is insane. You can't... The problem is, in terms of how we formulate COLAs, inflationary costs for seniors, who knows what the problem is? Yes, sir? It's, it's based on a basket that, that doesn't really apply to seniors. Seniors have much higher drug costs, much higher feeding costs, that sort of thing. It's based on groceries, which are made by less of... What's your, what's your name? Bill Walsh. All right, Bill got it exactly. Here's the way it's calculated. A 21-year-old college student goes out and buys a new computer. The odds are that computer this year may be less expensive than it was last year. Somebody buys a flat screen TV, may be less expensive than it was last year. Most people 80 years old are not buying computers and they're not buying flat screen TVs. What they are buying are prescription drugs. What they are purchasing are health care needs. What they are trying to do is keep themselves warm in a New Hampshire winter or cool in an Arizona summer. That's where they are spending their money. And what I have fought for for years and will implement as president is what we call a segregated index for seniors. Let's look at where seniors are spending their money. 
And if the cost of prescription drugs goes down, that's great. We'll take that into consideration. Healthcare costs go down, that's great. But that's not what's happening. So it is wrong to lump seniors purchasing practices with 19-year-olds. They are purchasing different things. And uh, we are going to fight uh, to have a separate index uh, for seniors. What the chain CPI would do is actually make it harder uh, for seniors to get an increase uh, in their Social Security benefits. That's one way they want to cut Social Security. The other way they want to do it is to raise the retirement age uh, higher than it is uh, right now. I mean, make it much higher in years to come. So we are going to oppose that uh, as well. Okay, that's my speech. I'm sticking to it. Uh, any questions that uh, Bill? First of all, not a question, but a comment. Uh, a drug company is Pfizer. I understand yesterday uh, now that they're considering um, uh, joining with a, uh, I think, an Irish company, so they could offshore their headquarters and their profits and avoid to Ireland and avoid their taxes. And there's a lot of other companies who've already done that. Yes. Yeah. Comment. Well, I, I think it stinks, and it's not just drug companies. Uh, one of the, you know, I've been criticized in this campaign for saying, you know, not only should we raise Social Security benefits, not only should we lower the cost of the prescription drugs, but we should make sure that every young person who has the ability should be able to get a college education by making public colleges and universities tuition free, that maybe we should create millions of jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. And people say, well, how are you going to pay for all of this stuff? Well, I'll tell you how we're going to pay for it. By ending those types of loopholes. There are major corporations in this country who in a given year make billions of dollars in profit. You know how much they pay in taxes? That's right, zero. They pay zero. We've got to eliminate that. In my view, we have to impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. We've got to raise the, make the estate tax much more progressive, which impacts only the very, very, very wealthiest people in this country. So I think, given the fact that there has been a multi-trillion dollar transfer of wealth from the middle class to the top one-tenth of one percent, it is appropriate in a variety of ways to end these loopholes and ask the very wealthiest people to stop paying their fair share of taxes so people in the middle can start living with some dignity. Yes, ma'am. Stand up. Hi, I'm Marissa. Um, given the setting, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have known someone or lost someone due to Alzheimer's or another dementia. Um, as senator, you've been very progressive in uh, the needs of the Alzheimer's community. So I'm wondering, as president, what would you do to ensure that caregivers get the support they need, and will you continue to talk about this in your Absolutely. campaign? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I will talk about it for several reasons. Alzheimer's is a terrible and tragic illness, as you know, causing... We, we all know what Alzheimer's does and what it means to families when your mom doesn't know who you are and so forth. But here's what else it is doing. Not only is it a human tragedy for large numbers and growing numbers, as we live longer, it becomes a more serious problem. You know what else it is? It is going to be a major crisis for Medicare. We're going to be spending a very significant part of our Medicare budget just on Alzheimer's. So it goes 